on my end. Okay. All right. Okay. The meeting is being recorded. All right. Let's try this again. Let's jump right in. Again, exploring Heritage Quest and Fold3 databases. All right. Let me give you, let me start with a little bit of general information and talk a little bit about why these websites, uh, these databases are important. A um, little bit of general information to start. Both of these are actually owned by Ancestry.com. So they will have some similar features and they will share some of the same data sets. And we'll talk about that as we go through here. Um, why these are important though, and this is, th this is pretty big, libraries often have both in library and at home access. And I believe the Evansville Library does, St. Louis County Library does, hopefully yours does as well. So these are free and convenient for you to use. No subscription necessary, and you can use them from the comfort of your own home. Remember, Many of you currently have access to Ancestry.com at home through your library. Due to COVID, Ancestry did make that available to patrons of many libraries at home, but they are saying that that is going to end on December 31st of this year. Now they have extended that, I think at least a couple times, so they may again, but they may stick to this, um, you know, judging by the fact that most libraries are now open. So that access may end. You may not have the home access to Ancestry.com. So Heritage Quest and Fold3 are two that you can sort of use to take the place of that. And they are free and you can use them at home through your library. All right, and both of these databases give you a great base to begin or advance your genealogy research. All right, how to access them. Now, I actually left these slides in for the St. Louis County Library just to sort of remind you, if you haven't used your databases in a while, um, to remember how to access your own databases at your library. Um, for us, we have a research tab. We'll actually go to our website, slcl.org, and we have a research tab. If you hover over that, you could click on online genealogy resources. Now, again, most of you are not using our website, but just a little, little thing to remind you to make sure that you know how to access yours. Okay, first I wanna talk about Heritage Quest. Little bit of info here on Heritage Quest. I like to call Heritage Quest Ancestry.com Light. And by this, I mean it is a version of Ancestry. It has, it shares a lot of the same data sets or record sets as Ancestry, but it doesn't have all of it. It just has select pieces of Ancestry. But I actually think Heritage Quest is kind of nice sometimes because it's a little bit less overwhelming than Ancestry.com. You don't have as much. When you look something up, you don't have as many um, options. So if you're just doing census research, if you're just doing a particular type of research, sometimes using Heritage Quest can be better. Especially, I would say, if you're new. Again, so you don't get overwhelmed. Um, Heritage Quest is actually not its own uh, database that you can subscribe to like Ancestry. It is accessed through your library only. It's actually through uh, something called ProQuest. Uh, I usually use Heritage Quest for census records, but it includes other record sets, again, from Ancestry.com. Okay, this is what the main page of Heritage Quest looks like. And I want to talk a little bit about what you see on this main page, in particular, these tabs at the top. So this middle tab right here is the Research Aids tab. Uh, if you click on that, you will get, if you're just, especially if you're just starting with genealogy and you're kind of soaking it all in, you're like a sponge and you want to read, um, you know, all that you can about doing genealogy, they've got some great articles here on getting started. They've got a lot of information about using the census. And they also have some information about, you know, other specific types of research beyond the basics, they call it. So if you want to do a little bit of studying, that's where you're going to do it. Okay, another tab that I want to talk about is the Maps tab on Heritage Quest. If you click there, 
you're going to go to the map guide to the US federal censuses. Now this is a book, um, you may have it in your library, we do in ours, and this book is very useful because it shows you every state and it shows you the progression of the counties in every state since 1790. So this is particularly useful if you're doing research back say in the early 1800s, um, and you want to know, was this county around then? Was it part of another county? So if I look at Missouri, I can click on that and say I want to look at Missouri in 1840. And so that's what I'm seeing there. I'm seeing the counties in Missouri in 1840, which certainly don't look like the counties today, which are in white, and the counties back then are in black. Um, many records are kept and were kept at the county level, so that's why this is important. So if you're ever wondering, you know, if you have that question on any of your ancestors and where they were from, check out this maps tab at Heritage Quest. Okay, then the other tab, oh, actually we're going to talk about this. They, they put some of their highlighted data sets right here. Um, so, but that's certainly not all of they all that they have. I think that's a little bit confusing. Kind of makes you think that's all they have. Um, they just kind of put some highlighted ones there. Okay. Otherwise, let's go to the search. So we can do a search on Heritage Quest from either here or here. And when we click one of those search buttons, we end up on this page. And you'll see that they have these boxes with different titles. So we have the census, we have books, wills and probates, city directories, military records, immigration records. If we scroll down on this page, we also have public records, social security death index, revolutionary war pensions, and so on. Um, and then we have some other um, ones not in boxes at the bottom. So that's how we kind of get started searching here as we choose what we want to search on. So let's go back to the main page and we're going to do an example of searching the census because I think the census is so important. If you're new to genealogy, this is probably one of the records that you want to start with and it's very easy to do from Heritage Quest. If you've been doing it from Ancestry, it's gonna be the same interface and it's very easy to use. So they do put all of the census years right on the front page. So you don't even need to use that search button. If I wanna look for someone in the 1940 census, I just simply click on 1940 and I'm taken right to the 1940 census search page. This probably looks familiar <laughs> because it looks exactly like Ancestry.com. So that should be comforting that if you do lose that Ancestry.com uh, home use, that this can take its place and it, it, it'll make you feel comfortable because it looks just like it. All right, so if you scroll down on that page, it'll also give you some source information. It will give you information about the 1940 census. Uh, it will give you information about what things were asked, um, interesting facts about the census, um, and all of that. Usually it tells you exactly when the census was taken that, that year, and sometimes that's helpful, that's useful to know. Okay, going back to the search page, we are going to do a search on for Miriam O'Brien. This is actually a um, this is actually my husband's grandmother, and I do know that she was living in East Orange, New Jersey. Uh, this will sort of uh, auto populate for you if it recognizes what you're typing. So again, East Orange, Essex County, New Jersey and let's see what we can find on her. But before we do that, a couple of things. And this goes for Ancestry, this goes for Heritage Quest. When you're looking for censuses, be careful with how much information you give it. So a couple of quick search tips. Sometimes less is more when you're looking for these. You have all of these boxes that they give you to fill in, but you don't need to fill them all in. Many of, this, many of these things, a lot of this information isn't even going to be on the census. And if you try to fill everything in, it's just going to confuse Heritage Quest and you probably won't get any results. 
Now you also need to be careful, you know, if you put in too little information, you may have too many results, but you can always go back in and add information uh, to sort of narrow it down. Another thing, quick tip, if I search for her and I get no results, um, a good thing to do is to try other people that you know she was living with. If you know any of the names of her siblings, if you know her parents' names, go ahead and try them. Because as we all know, if you've been doing genealogy for any amount of time, that handwriting is terrible, misspellings are common, and all of that. So try someone else because it may pick up that person. All right, so let's see what we get. So right off the bat, I can tell that she's gonna be on here. First though, we can also filter a little bit once we get to this page. We can change some of the settings over here to the left. We can make our search more broad or more exact. Um, so don't be afraid to do that if you do get too many results. But I actually see her right away here because I, I didn't know her parents' names or I had an inkling what her parents' names were. So this looks like her, so we're gonna go ahead and click on that. Again, should look very familiar, kind of looks like Ancestry. We've got the uh, information page, but remember, this is someone's transcription of that page. So we always wanna look at the actual record and we can click on that and there it is. If we, let me close this for just a second. <clears throat> if we want to, we could do some things with this record we can, whoops, hold on just a second. Okay, we can make it larger or smaller, and certainly we probably need to <laughs> with the census. So we can blow that up, and there she is. There's Miriam O'Brien, the fourth from the top there in the yellow. She was 24, and that is her uh, family there. Those are her siblings. All right, so we can also, over to the side here, if you click on the tools icon, you can print, you can download, you can rotate, you can do all those sorts of things there. And if you click on the save uh, icon there, you can save the image. All right, you can also use this little pop out here to give you some information on the side here. Um, what we're looking at now is the source information. So that's what you would use if you were gonna make a citation. But we also have one here that says related. And if you click on that, that is actually gonna be what you see on Ancestry sometimes in the lower right hand uh, corner of your screen where it gives you other records that it thinks are your uh, person. Remember, these sites are very good at that, but they're not always 100%. So definitely look at the records and study them for yourself and make sure that you know they are, they are your person. Okay, let's go back to the main page. And I also wanna show you here. So down below the census records, if I didn't wanna search a specific census, I just wanted to search all of the censuses, I could click on view all, and sometimes I actually like to do this if it's someone new that I'm researching and I just wanna kinda of see what comes back. I may just search all of them. If I scroll down here, I will also get a listing of all of the censuses that I can search, including the special censuses. So this one, for example, is the 1890 veterans schedule. So those are on here as well, and I can search that. Okay, and then one more thing, going back to this 1940 census, just like with Ancestry, you can also browse these censuses. Um, this can come in very handy if you're having trouble picking up a person on the census. And if you do know where they were living, if they happen to be in a city, but maybe you know their address, so you can find out their enumeration district, or this works particularly well if they're in a rural area and you know the township, you know, and, and there aren't as many pages, there aren't as many people living there. You can easily browse through the census and try to find that person. It's also very helpful to look at who they were living by. Um, a lot of us uh, use fans, friends, associates, and neighbors to help us with our genealogy, and that allows you to do that. Okay, and if anybody heard that, that was thunder. We've got a little uh, 
weather moving through St. Louis here. Okay, let's take a look at another data set that they have on here, and that is the books. So they do have a lot of family history books on Heritage Quest. So if we click on there, we're going to be taken to family history books and directories. Now, if we click on publications, we can see a list of them. So you could go through and look, and you can actually, if you look out to the left, you can actually search for a title of a book, but they do have hundreds of them on here. So it'd almost be kind of hard for you to browse through them all. But again, you can search for a title. Um, city directories they do have on here. I would actually not really recommend using the city directories on Heritage Quest. You certainly can. They're on Ancestry too. But I'm going to show you a better way in Fold 3 in just a little while. Okay. So going back to the history book search page, I'm going to look for a Josiah Crosby, and he was living in New Hampshire. And let's see what we can find on him. And it looks like right off the bat, we've got a book, Sketches of Successful New Hampshire Men. Definitely looks interesting. Let's take a look at it. And there he is. Um, remember, when we're using this, we can do all of the things uh, that we could do with um, the other record that I showed you. We can zoom in, we can zoom out, we can save, we can do all of that. But we can also, and you can do this with any of the records, you can also uh, go through the pages. So we can flip through and we can read uh, the book, okay? So that is definitely helpful. All right, wills and probate records they have on here as well. So we are going to click on wills and probates and I'll show you what that looks like. We're gonna be taken to this page and you can see there are uh, wills and probates from a lot of different states. Again, these are taken from Ancestry. So these are on Ancestry as well. If we scroll down, we do see that they have Missouri US wills and probate records. So we're gonna click on that one. And we're going to look for an ancestor of mine by the name of Klaus Wilshusen. And he was living in St. Louis, Missouri. And I wanted to show you how this auto-populated here. Um, because if you're looking for any ancestors who, who are from places where there's an abbreviation, for example, with St. Louis, the ST period, for some reason, both Ancestry and Heritage Quest does not always like those periods. So if you look there, if you want it to pick up St. Louis, you actually have to just do ST, L-O-U-I-S, without the period. Um, so just a tip for any of you who are um, looking at, you know, putting in any of those types of places. All right, so here are our results. And we're gonna take a look at this one right here. It looks like there might be some neat stuff in there. So we're gonna click on that. And again, we've got the information page, but if we click on the thumbnail, we have the um, whole probate, all the probate pages. All right, so don't forget to look for those. Okay, now we're going to check out the Social Security Death Index. I put this one on here because this is a great, I, I wanted to highlight this one because this is a great uh, substitute for a death certificate or an obituary, if you're trying to find out when an ancestor, or maybe it's a collateral you know, ancestor, when they passed away, and in some cases, if they've passed away. So if you click on the Social Security Death Index, you will get to, again, familiar search page, and we're gonna look for Dorothy Snipes, and I know that she was living in Mississippi. Now you'll notice that it says Social Security Death Index. Hello? Here. 1935 to 2014. So those ancestors who were working after 1935 would have had to apply for a Social Security number, Social Security card, and then once they uh, 
started taking their benefits and then, or someone else did, and they passed away, they would be in the social security death index. So again, it's a great substitute for another type of death record. Um, let's search for her. I think that's her, the first one there in Cleveland. And unfortunately, this is just an, is not an image record, but I can see from it her social security number, her birth date, so I can make sure it's her, where her last residence was, and her death date. So now I do know she passed, I do know where she passed, and so maybe I can look there for an obituary or something like that. Um, maybe not a death certificate as she just passed in 1999. That might not be publicly available, but at least I do know that she did pass. Um, and another thing, just a little tip, once you have that social security number, if there's any other information that you don't know about her, uh, that social security number may be able to unlock it for you. Um, just a quick example, I had a uh, great grandfather who was the immigrant from Germany in my family. He um, didn't talk much about his family. I was not able to ever glean from any other relatives or anything who his parents were or where he was from in Germany. I couldn't find it on any records here. But he did have a social security number, did apply for a social security card, and I was able to request his original application from the National Archives, and on it, he did put his parents, and that included his mother's maiden name, and that was actually the key to unlock where he was from in Germany, and I have since gone back a few generations there in Germany. So, um, so don't underestimate the power of the social security number. All right, another great thing they have on here are land ownership maps. This is down in the bottom on the search maps and photos. And these are actually from county atlases that you may have in book form in your library. We have several of them at ours. But if you click on that, you'll be searching in these. You can also, of course, browse if you'd like. We're going to use Charles Briggs from Ohio as an example. And what we get here, it looks like Charles Briggs in um, Clark County owned multiple pieces of land uh, from these results, but we'll just take a look at this first one. And if we click on that thumbnail there, we do get the map where his land is located. If we zoom in on it, and there it is right there, Charles Briggs. And remember, there's a lot you can do with land information, um, especially if you're trying to trace land back to see who the first landowner was. Um, you could use that survey number in order to find the deeds and, and that sort of thing. So, so this county, uh, these county maps are a great resource. Okay, couple of other mentions of records here. If you're doing a specific type of research. For example, if you're doing African American research, this database does have the Freedmen's Bank records. So this is where a lot of newly freed slaves would have opened bank accounts at these Freedmen's Banks. Um, and it's pretty amazing the amount of information that they ask you actually on the application when you uh, started banking there, where you were born, names of your family members, and things like that. So that's a good database. If you are doing um, maybe like a lineage society, uh, the DAR or the SAR, uh, this database has Revolutionary War Pension and Bounty Land Warrant application files on it. Uh, another one that it has, and I just recently noticed this, is if you click on the cemeteries box, it takes you here and you'll notice that they have the find a grave indexes and find a grave has become so much more popular in the last couple years a lot of people are using it so they do have indexes on here for that all right and then um one more thing here if you go all the way down it says more u.s records it says european records if you click on those these are US vital records. So they're from different states. Remember though, whether you're using Ancestry or whether you're using Heritage Quest, it says, for example, Alabama, US select marriage indexes. Emphasis on the word select. We go to these sometimes and we think we're going to find something, but we have to remember that select means they don't have them all. They may only have certain counties, 
they um, you know, may only have certain years. So always keep that in mind that it's fine to search these vital records on these big uh, databases, but they may not have everything and you still may have to go closer to the source, like to the, you know, the local library or something like that. Um, or family search a lot of times is a good one for that, but we'll be talking about that in a couple months. Okay, and then same thing goes for European records. You know, you can look at the German uh, baptisms, but it won't include them all. Okay, let's go ahead. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at the chat real quick and see if there are any questions that I can answer about Heritage Quest before I go on to Fold 3, since it's kind of a lot of information. Um, let's see. Uh, we're still talking about the handouts. Um, we've got some emails there. in here, so we'll have to make sure that we get those out to people when we're finished. Um, and I think, oh, okay, I think maybe Vanetta has sent it out to everyone. Okay, all right, so I don't actually see any questions directly related to uh, Heritage Quest. So let's go ahead and go on to Fold 3. So I hope everyone is kind of getting into a military mood because we're going to talk about those military records. All right, so Fold 3 is a great resource. Let's talk a little bit about it. Fold 3 has a lot of military records. So that's kind of what they're known for. But they also have a lot of non-military records as well. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that a lot of your 20th century military records may be limited. And some of you may be aware of this, and some of you may not be. Um, but in 1973, there was a fire at the National Personnel Records Center, actually here in St. Louis. And unfortunately, a lot of military personnel files were destroyed. And what's really devastating is right here. So in the branch of the Army, all personnel discharged between November of 1912 and January of 1960, about 80% of those files were destroyed. So unfortunately, that includes soldiers from World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and again, at an 80% loss, it's pretty devastating, you know, for those of us doing genealogy. Now, Certainly not everything was lost. Um, some of the records they've tried to kind of reconstruct, um, but you know, we have to kind of unfortunately deal with that. All right, real quickly, why is this database called Fold3? Fold3 comes from a traditional flag folding ceremony in which the third fold is made in honor and remembrance of veterans who served in defense of their country and to maintain peace throughout the world. So that's why they chose that name. All right, what types of military records will we be able to find on Fold 3? Let's just take a look at a few of the things that we can find. So this is a World War I draft registration card. This is actually a list of sailors on a Navy ship, the USS Macomb in 1944. This is a Civil War pension card. Um, doesn't tell us a whole lot of information about George Carson, but it does tell us his company and his regiment and when he was enlisted, and it does give some application numbers. So again, I talked about sometimes these things can lead you to other places, like with the Social Security number. Um, with these, some of these have been digitized, but some you still have to send away to the National Archives for, um, but you can send away for a soldier's pension packet, application packet, and sometimes there are some very good records in there. In particular, so we can see that a widow made a claim on this, and sometimes those family members would have to prove who they were. So there may be things in the pension files, such as a marriage license or something like that, 
um, that can be very useful and helpful and really neat to have for our genealogy. Uh, but keep in mind, this is fairly expensive. <laughs> the last time I checked, I think it was about $80. And you don't really know what's going to be in there. So it's kind of a surprise. There may be a whole lot. There may be really not much. So, um, but just something I wanted to mention. Okay, this is actually a uh, land, a military land warrant. So this person was a revolutionary soldier in the Virginia Continental Line, it says, and he is being granted 200 acres of land for his service. This is actually a handwritten letter detailing someone's uh, service in the Revolutionary War um, in order to get their, their land. This is actually a yearbook from a military base in the 1970s, which is pretty, pretty neat. This is a book that somebody wrote about a famous uh, military uh, Massachusetts artillery company. Probably has a lot of history and lists some of the famous soldiers that were in that company. And this is actually a uh, card from a Confederate soldier's uh, service packet where he takes an oath of allegiance to the Union after being captured. And what's neat about this one is it has a description, his place of residence, and then it has a description, his complexion, his hair, his eyes, his height. So, you know, we're always looking for pictures. Um, oftentimes we don't find them. But sometimes we find descriptions and, you know, those are really just as neat to imagine, you know, what these people would have looked like and, um, you know, really put some meat on the bones and it makes the person more than just a name and a date. So those are just a few examples of some of the things that you'll find. This is what the main page of Fold3 looks like. Um, we are, of course, using it through the St. Louis County Library, but you have access um, most likely through your library. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Help tab. Uh, if you click on that, you will go to the Full 3 Training Center. And say after this presentation, you still want to do a little bit more research, still want to look more into how to search on Full 3 So you can click, if you want to learn more about searching, you can click on there. And you can watch some videos on how to do searches and things on Full 3 so, so definitely, if you want to take advantage of that help center. All right, the next tab uh, to the left is the Memorials tab. And I want to talk a little bit about this one. If we hover over that, we get to the US Honor Wall. And if we click on that, this is actually a part of Fold3 where um, people have, uh, subscribers have actually put in information about their ancestors or their loved ones who fought in various conflicts. So you can search to see if your uh, person has anything up here. In this case, we're gonna search for James Edward Henry. And here he is. And if we scroll down, we can find a lot of information about him. It looks like he was born in 1946. He was involved in the Vietnam War. We have, he was in the Marine Corps. Um, his battalion, his rank, his company, his regiment. He received a gold star. Um, it looks like he was unfortunately killed um, March 26, 1967. He was 21 years old. Um, at the very bottom, we can actually see that uh, they've given us the location of his name on the memorial wall. So you may want to check if your person, if anybody's done this for your person. Um, unfortunately, though, if you're using Fold3 through the library, if you click on create a memorial, you won't be able to do one. Uh, you'll be prompted to sign into Fold3. So only paying subscribers of individual subscribers of Fold3 can actually create those, those memorials. So as a library user, you have access to them, but you won't be able to create one. All right, full three, um, we're going to be talking, not looking so much at the types of records, we're going to be looking more at how to search it. Um, my colleagues and I at the St. Louis County Library, the best word we've come up with uh, when we're searching full three is 
clunky. We just find it a little clunky to search Fold3. It's definitely not as intuitive or as easy as an Ancestry.com or a Heritage Quest. So I'm going to show you a few different ways to search for records. We're going to do a Civil War soldier example, and then we're going to do a city, we're going to do a non-military example. We're going to do a city directory example. And my hope is just that even if you don't remember exactly the steps I took here, I'm hoping that you will be able to, when you go on yourself, just feel a little bit more comfortable navigating it. And hopefully, you know, you'll have a little easier time finding your way around. Okay, so a couple ways to search. The first one we're going to talk about is searching from the homepage search box or the search tab. So that would be here or here. Okay, in this case, we're going to use the search tab and we're going to put a name in here. Um, we're going to search for a William Sherman and this will also auto populate if it recognizes the name. So let's search on that and see what we find. Okay, so we've got a lot of results for William Sherman, but if you look at the icon, there's Social Security Death Index records, but we're looking for him as a soldier, and um, this wouldn't be the right William Sherman. So we're gonna have to filter over here. So we're gonna choose a conflict. In this case, we're gonna choose the Civil War, and I know that he was a Union soldier. And then we're also going to choose Missouri because we know that he was from Missouri. And it looks like this is the William Sherman that I could be looking for based on the age and when he was in the war. Um, so if we click on that, we'd be able to see his record. We are going to look at this record, but let me show you two other ways to search for it first, and then we'll take a look at it. Okay, the next way to search is from the conflict box. Okay, when you're on the main page of Fold3, you will see these boxes right here, and you'll see the names of conflicts. So you have the US Revolutionary War. If you scroll down on this page, you'll have the Civil War, you'll have World War I, Spanish-American War. If we scroll down a little further, we've got World War II, and then we've even got you know, up to modern wars. Um, if we scroll down a little bit more, we also see non-military records as well as some other publications. And my publications on Fold3, basically they mean like a record set, a data set. Okay, group of records, group of the same type of records. All right, so in this case, we're going to go back up to U.S. Civil War Union because we're pretty sure that he was uh, a Union soldier. So we're going to be taken to this page, U.S. Civil War Union, and if you look over here to the left, uh, it says overview and then it says publications. So again, those are just our sets of data. If we click on publications, we can actually see a list of everything that they have on the U.S. Civil War Union side. But in this case, I think it would be better for us to, and, and that's where, you know, you can scroll down and see all of those. But I actually think in this case, it would be better for us to go back to the overview and just search by name. So we're going to put William Sherman in there, and we're going to see what we get. And here we are. So basically what happens when you search by conflict is that these things are already going to be selected for you. So they've already selected Civil War, they've already selected Union. I'm actually going to go ahead and select Missouri as well. And again, there he is again. Okay, the other way that you can search for records on Fold3 is by browsing. I don't really recommend this so much for military records um, if you don't already know what you're looking for. Um, I think it would be overwhelming. I'm not sure you'd be able to just sort of guess, you know, where your soldier was. So I think searching is better. But I just wanted to show you how the browsing works. So we're going to click on Browse. And again, this looks familiar. We're going to have to do all of our filtering on the side here. So we're going to do Civil War. And then I want to show you some of the things. So I'm going to, this uh, column right here, I'm going to scroll down and show you some of the different things that they actually have for the Civil War on the Union side. They have widow's pensions. 
you can see there. They have Civil War Service Index, Civil War Milestone Documents, Civil War Pensions Index. If we scroll down, we have Civil War Service Records. In this case, we're looking at um, some of the service records for colored troops. If we scroll down some more, we have Medal of Honor recipients. We have some Navy records. Um, we have some records specific to New York. If we keep going, we have um, information on the Sultana disaster. We have um, unit histories. Okay, but in our case, we're actually gonna go back to Civil War service records for Missouri. So we're gonna select that, and then it's gonna give us an opportunity to select the second light artillery. Again, I already knew that he was in that, so I'm able to do that. Most of the time, you won't, so you'll just search on his name. I'm gonna choose last names that begin with S. And there he is, William Sherman. Okay, so let's take a look at these records after. So we talked about the three ways to search. We can use the search box. We can browse from the search from the conflict, or we can just browse everything. But either way, we're gonna to get to these records. So let's take a look at what we have. Let's click on this first part of the records here. And here it is. So this is actually the outside of his folder <clears throat> that contains all of his service records. What we also have on this page is we have some, uh, our information, the transcribed information. If we scroll down, we also have some citation information. And also on this page, it's kind of, there's a, a lot going on there. So you can actually get rid of some of this. If you click on this film strip, all of the uh, pages at the bottom will go away. And if you actually want to close this information box, you can actually just drag it closed and it'll close. It's not bothering me too much though, so we're gonna leave it open. All right, and then you can also go back and forth through the records by using the arrows. So let's see what else is in here. So we've got a muster card. So in here are gonna be several muster roll cards where it gives you a certain time. This was September and October of 1964, and he is showing as present uh, when they did the, uh, took the roll. November and December, he was also present. Uh, here's another one, January and February of 1965, he was also present. Uh, again, in May and June of 1865, he was present. This is interesting. This is his descript, this is muster and descriptive role of a detachment of U.S. And if you look, it gives an, a description of him. He's from St. Louis. Where was he born? Um, his occupation was farmer, when he enlisted, where he enlisted, and it gives his uh, eye color, complexion, um, and all of that. So again, very uh, always neat when we can find that stuff. Okay, here was his volunteer enlistment form. Um, and next, so this was a letter that was in his file, and I thought this was very interesting. So we can, again, zoom in over here, so we can uh, zoom in or out. And in this case, we're gonna zoom in. And if you read this area here in the box, it says it's an application for a furlough of 30 days absent from duty. Private William Sherman of this battery, uh, it says he was recently a patient in the smallpox hospital. So he must have had smallpox. He was applying for a furlough so that's pretty interesting. That might be something that I might want to keep. Uh, so I'll show you how to do that printing and saving in just a minute. First of all, though, I want to show you that one thing on Fold3 that you can't do on a lot of other databases is you can actually change the brightness and the contrast on the document. So if it's one that's kind of hard to read, you can actually work on that a little bit, which again, you can't do that on a lot of the, a lot of the sites. You have to save it and then kind of play around with it later on your computer. Um, also up here, if you click on the tools, you can download and you can print. Uh, but this is what I wanted to mention on the downloading. If you click on download, if you wanna download this record and save it to your computer, you can save the entire page, you can select a region, 
or you can download the entire file. And I just wanted to warn you that if you do click on entire file, it's going to give you uh, this, where again, you have to be a member, that just an individual paying member of Fold3 to download the entire file. But that's okay. You can just download page by page um, if you're just using it through the library. All right. Now, one thing that I think is neat about military records is you can find these, like we found this packet, and you can use it to find more information out about where this soldier went. You can research the battles he may have been involved in and so on. Um, I just wanted to sort of give a shout out to the National Park Services website. It's nps.gov slash civil war. And so if you do have any of these civil war uh, veteran ancestors, and you are able to, through your records, find out what their specifics were on what group they were fighting with, you can actually go to this website, put that information in, and for many of them, they give a write-up about where this unit actually went. So in this case with William Sherman, we know he was in this 2nd Regiment Light Artillery, and I'll try to blow this up it's not going to get real big, but you can see that it gives everywhere that they went. And it's absolutely fascinating, you know, many places around the country. So if you do have those military uh, veteran ancestors, or if you're just interested in military history, um, you're going to really like doing a lot of this stuff. So I would encourage you to even take it further um, and really try to imagine, you know, what it would have been like to fight in all these places around the, around the country. Um, Okay, that was a military example. Now we're gonna do a non-military example. And I really like Fold3 for city directories. So if you do have some ancestors who were living in larger towns or cities um, that they do have city directories for, I would definitely recommend using this above all other sources. It's very easy to use, um, mostly from the Browse tab though, but I will show you, show you the other two first. So we're gonna kind of do the same thing where we're gonna start from the homepage search box or from the search tab. So in this case, we're just gonna put him in there in this, uh, in this homepage box. We're gonna look for Henry Weezy. And we're gonna get a whole lot of results on Henry Weezy of all types. So remember, we're gonna to need to filter over here to the left. And in this case, we're actually gonna scroll down on the left until we see city directories. Um, now we've got some cities listed there, but not the one we want. So we're gonna to go to see all. And actually, Henry Weezy was living in Kansas City. So we're going to choose Kansas City. And now we have some results. And actually, this looks like it could be him. And he's been found in a 1913 uh, Kansas City uh, City Directory. All right, we'll look at that record in just a minute. Let's take a look at, it, at another way that we can search for it, and that is from that non-military box. So remember, on the homepage, we've got these different boxes, and we are going to go scroll down to where it says non-military, and we're gonna click on that, and we can again look at the publications if we want. And in this case, I would actually recommend doing that, not searching by name. I would recommend going to the publications. We can scroll down until we find City Directories Kansas City. We're gonna click on that. And now we're only searching in the Kansas City Directories. So we're gonna search for Henry Weezy. And let's see what we get. And again, here he is. Okay, but this is actually the way that I prefer to do this. So for those, those of you who are wanting to do city directory research, and remember, city directories are great. Um, for those of you who have ancestors who were in, again, larger towns or cities, um, this is a great way to keep track of your ancestors in between census years. It's a great way to find out where they were living in case you need to maybe locate a church that they were attending to find some of those records or something like that. 
So city directories can be very useful. And remember, they don't give you a whole lot of information. They're not like a census. They don't give you all of the people living in the household. Usually it's just the head of the household, but it usually will give that person's occupation. It will give their address. So definitely working, worth looking at if that applies to your ancestors. Okay, so we're gonna browse for city directories. So we're gonna click on the browse tab. And here we are here. And a couple things I wanna show you. I wanna show you what kind of non-military records they do have on Fold3. So I'm gonna scroll down on that left side to non-military. And I wanna show you a few things that they have over here before we go to the city directories. So a couple things they have if we scroll down. They do have census records here on Fold3. So you can see they have 1860, 1900, 1910, 1920, 1930. Um, if we scroll down a little further, we do see that they have city directories. If you scroll down a little further, they do have some naturalization. Legends. If you scroll down a little bit more, you see they do have some newspapers. And scroll down a little bit more, they do have the Social Security Death Index, you see there in the center. And now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna go back up to city directories. So we're gonna choose city directories here. We're gonna choose city directories, Kansas City. We're gonna to try to find the same one. So we're gonna choose 1913. And once we get through all that, there it is. There is the 1913 Kansas City directory. Now, if I scroll down, because again, I'm looking for Wheezy, so these pages are gonna be in alphabetical order. If I scroll all the way down, actually right here, I see Henry Wheezy. So the way that they do this on Fold3, is they will actually put the first person's name on each page under that page. So you can easily find who you're looking for. So it's, they sort of show you alphabetically um, what pages, which pages are what. So we can click on this and we do have the directory page. We're gonna have to zoom in a bit. So remember you can do that on the right hand side. And it looks like our Henry Wheezy is right here. Looks like he was a clerk in a store and he lived at 1613 Summit. So there we have him. And again, we can print, we can download um, multiple things we could do there. All right, we can also search for a specific type of record on Fold3. So we can just go from this search box here in, at the very beginning, and I'm wondering if they have headstone applications. Um, so I'm gonna search for that, and it sure looks like they do, headstone applications. So I can click on that right there, and there I am. Uh, on the Headstone Applications, 1925 to 1963. I can search for Edgar Snipes. This is actually my great uncle. And unfortunately, he was killed in the Korean War. Um, so I wanna see if he had a Headstone application. So let's search for him. And there he is right there, Edgar Tate Snipes. So I can click on that. And there it is right there. So I do know that he did apply, or his family did apply for Headstone, but remember with a lot of these records, read that whole record, because we've got some great stuff in here, including the fact that he won a silver star, that was actually in World War II, and he had won a Purple Heart. So, you know, you never know what you're gonna find in these, uh, in these different records. Now, unfortunately, he fought in World War II and he did pass away in the, during the Korean War. Um, and there is not much left of his file. I have actually requested it from the National Personnel Records Center and I got a letter back saying that they didn't have anything on him. Um, but his, uh, his unit has actually had a lot of things uh, written up on it. Um, he actually was killed in action in the Chosen Reservoir. I don't know if anybody is familiar with that. Um, but so there have been you know, movies and things made about that. So there, there, has, there is a lot of information out there about um, you know, what he went through. So I was able to find a lot of that. So that was pretty neat. 
Okay, another thing that you might want to look at is you can access the recently updated records. So if you go all the way down to the bottom of this main screen, it's going to look like this. And we want to click on list records. And what you're going to get is a page that looks like this. And if you look over here, it says sort. And you can sort by recently updated. So if you do that, it's going to look like this. And you'll be able to see what is new on there. And the other thing that I think is interesting is you can see how complete the files are or the data set is. So sometimes they're starting to digitize and upload files to these databases like Fold3 but they're not actually complete. So if you're looking for someone who fought for Canada in World War II and you're not finding them, well, it might be because that data set is only 1% complete. So just something you, know, you might wanna check. I know for a long time they were supposed to be uh, digitizing and uploading a lot of those Civil War pensions. Um, but they never seem to you know, have it 100% complete, and I, I, I'm not sure that it still is. So, um, so anyway, that's another thing that you can look at if you're having trouble finding uh, an ancestor. Okay, we've talked about a few shared data sets between these two databases. So I'm gonna tell you which one I prefer to use for which types of records. So for example, if you're doing census research, which is definitely where I would tell you to start if you're new to genealogy, um, and you're wanting to look at the US federal censuses, I would definitely use HeritageQuest. HeritageQuest uses the Ancestry interface. It is very, very intuitive, very, very easy to use. Um, you really can't beat it, okay? If you are wanting to do city directory research, I would definitely use Fold3. As you saw me go through the browse for the city directories, you can go right to the city and right to the year that you want, and you can just browse to your heart's desire. So I would definitely use Fold3 for city directories. If you're wanting to look in the Social Security Death Index uh, to see if, uh, if, and, you know, if and when um, someone has passed, I would definitely use Heritage Quest. Again, you've got that Ancestry.com uh, interface that's a whole lot easier to use. Again, I refer, we refer to Fold3 as just a little bit clunky. And there are others that they share, so it's just sort of you know, personal preference as to which one you prefer to use. All right, a couple of final thoughts as we wrap up here. Both of these databases are free and they have remote access, most likely through your library. So if you don't wanna to have to get a subscription and especially if that ancestry.com home access ends at the end of this year, um, especially with Heritage Quest, this is definitely a substitute. It doesn't have everything that Ancestry does, but it does have a lot. Okay, and both of these contain important beginning and advanced genealogy records. So they're really good for the beginner as well as the advanced genealogist. And last but not least, good luck with all of your searching. I hope, like I said, that um, you know I could help introduce you to these. I hope I could maybe make you feel a little bit more comfortable with using them. And um, again, you know, now you can decide if it's something that you want to pursue in, uh, in your genealogy research or not. Um, so again, I wish you much luck. And what I'm gonna do now is I am going to check the chat and we're gonna see what we have on here. See if we have any questions. All right. So we've got the handouts. Um, someone asked about the Willard Library card, if I reside in Arizona. So I am with the St. Louis County Library, so perhaps someone can unmute and answer the question about the Evansville Library card access. Um, I know at the St. Louis County Library, we do allow uh, out of town uh, okay, to purchase a card. Um, I'm not sure how Evansville is though. I don't know if anybody wants to hop in or maybe answer it on the chat. 
Um, oh, never mind. I, I think I put the phone number on there for them to call the special collections department and they'll help them get a library card set up. I am sorry, I do see that. Yes, you can just call them and ask for special collections and they can help you with getting a card. The phone number is 812-425-4309. Um, you also may want to check if you are from out of town, if you are watching this from a different state, you may also want to check your own local library uh, to see if they have access as well. Okay, thank you. And, and yes, and thank you for, uh, for attending. Um, uh, in city directories and advertisements, I found a neat one for my dad's little grocery store before World War II. Yes, again, I think the greatest thing about genealogy a lot of times are those little nuggets and those just little diamonds that you find um, when you're looking and those are just, those are just so neat. So, um, yeah. I got kicked. Oh, somebody got kicked out. Uh-oh, I'm looking forward to watching the recording. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Um, and yes, and someone said thank you. And you are all very welcome. And thank you for attending. I, I hope, again, that I could be of some help to you. Um, remember that we this is sort of a three-part series. So next month, we are going to be sort of doing the same thing um, on Ancestry.com. So many of you are probably using Ancestry.com already, but I'm hoping that, um, you know, I can maybe give you some tips and maybe show you some areas of Ancestry.com that maybe you're unfamiliar with. And uh, in November, uh, that'll be October, and then in November, we're gonna be doing uh, the same thing on Family Search. So we'll be getting to know uh, how to use Family Search. And somebody asked, my name is Robin McDonough. It's um, actually, I don't have it on this screen that I'm up right now, but my name is Robin McDonough. I am with the History and Genealogy Department at the St. Louis County Library. And how do I see the recording? So we actually, unfortunately, we um, had a little miscommunication with um, how we were going to do the recording. So we are recording this, uh, but I'm not sure where it's going to be yet. I'm assuming it's going to be on the, uh, the, the tri-state uh, side. So I'm sure that Vanetta can um, maybe put that out on their website. So be looking for that. And the website is in the chat. And, uh, and Vanetta just said to everyone, thank you all for attending and look forward to seeing you next month. And let's just make sure um, we don't have any other questions coming in. And Vanetta says, if you're not looking at the chat, yes, uh, Tri-State will have the video at TG or tsgspaddlewheel.com. Um, so she'll have that. Okay, and, and we'll have to make sure that we um, get the, the, uh, the recording um, going uh, before we uh, do this next time in, in October. So, so we'll make sure that we do that. Okay, let me put mine back up there. Oops. Okay. All right, and let me see if we have any other questions. And there's my name up there. I put I put the first uh, first slide up there. So let's see if we have anything else. I'm not seeing anything. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Oh, I think we might have one in there. Let's see. <clears throat> oh, and someone said, said, great presentation. Thank you very much. And again, thank you. Thank you all, all for coming and thank you all for listening. And, um, and I hope it was helpful. And I'm looking forward to seeing all of you back next month. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting now. Again, thank you all. And I'll be looking for that on Tri-State's website. We'll try to uh, get that worked out as soon as we can. And again, I hope to see you all back next month for our presentation on Ancestry.com. Okay. Good night. Okay. Thanks again.